Welcome everybody to another episode of Ten Thousand Roads to Financial Independence. Today I have an awesome guest with us, Kenneth Wolf.、Um, he is the owner of fifty six hundred units.、Um, they've sold some, so they're currently holding three thousand eight hundred units.、Um, a huge portfolio all across、uh, the America, all across the nation over here, mostly focused in Texas.、Um, and、uh, Kenneth has been someone who is maybe ten or hundred step. You know, ahead of me, and then as someone who I have passively invested with as well. So, Kenneth, very welcome to our show today. Very excited about this show. Thanks for having me on, Lisa. I appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. So,、um, Kenny, walk us back to all the way back. You're such a huge entrepreneur. So,、um, where, like, who in your life do you think back, or incidents you think back that really kind of shaped who you are as entrepreneur and investor? Well, it's really that to, to me on the entrepreneurship. It's always that you know, you know are, are you going to take that big leap of faith, right?、Uh, because the vast majority of you know your peers um, and uh, folks around you、um, just tell you to get a W two and stay and stay this and go the safe route, right? And most people do, right? And it's probably for most people,、um, but, yeah. to be honest with you. But、uh, really, it was you know I kind of knew early on, like I went to、uh, Baylor University. Um, for their business school, they had a strong, strong、um, entrepreneurship program.、Uh, you know, so I, that was kind of my focus was just to be my own boss one day. I was just kind of was kind of born out of the womb, ready to go and do business. So,、um, so that's kind of who I, I was.、Uh, but I did, you know, I got the W two first、uh, for an oil and gas company on the accounting side to learn the ropes, and I learned a lot through that、uh, through that small oil and gas company. You wear a lot of hats,、uh, which is good. Um, and that kind of prepared me,、um, and then you know eventually I worked my way up to be a CFO level at the age of 28, you know,、um, and so that kind of teaches you, okay, these are the pieces I need to do、uh, to be an effective entrepreneur or and a leader of an organization. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So,、um, rarely do we have someone worked all the way up the corporate ladder to a CFO position and then decided,、uh, you know, you want to kind of switch ship over there. Um, so, tell us a little bit about that transition. What it comes about, like even though you thought about being an entrepreneur early in your life, is there a certain event, kind of like, or something leading up to it where the transition kind of happens? Yeah, I mean, kind of both, right? So, I mean, I, I went in、um, to、uh, that small oil and gas company、um, to to learn a lot about business, right, and how to how it actually works. Because in school, you learn th- theory, right, but not not real world applications, and so. Uh, really, that that was kind of how I looked at the job. Was you know, yes, I'm you know doing some entry level accounting early on, but、uh, but it's a way to to learn and grow, and that's how you、uh, learn how to be a、uh, be a successful business person. So,、um, but then really the big push was、um, as at CFO, we had a five year contract with an oil and gas operator.、Um, they were our sole client, and they started having money issues three years into our five year contract. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they started to slow pay us, and since I'm the on the dollars on the dollar side, I saw how slowly they started to come in. I like okay, so I got to figure something else out to do. So、um, kind of sat down with my wife. Look, you know, my dad was oil and gas. My grandfather on my mother's side was oil and gas. So we know this play. It's either feast or famine,、um, and it's about to be famine.、Um, and so we got to figure something else, something else to do. So that、mm-hmm. was kind of the big push is to okay, now we got to go figure it out. Um, and that was the jump into our two passive investments. First, we pa- invested passively in a、uh, yield play, which is、uh, supposed to be a fixed up and stable property. And I say supposed to, but anyways, had to jump in and save that one.、Um, and then、uh, myself. And then on the、um, uh, and then we did a value play, which is a, it was like the epitome of fixer upper. It was, I mean, the pizza delivery guy didn't want to go into the into the property. Um, it was that unsafe,、uh, you know. It was a horrible property,、uh, but we fixed it up and turned it into a, a big kind of home run investment too. But th- again, you know, I, I like to see, you know,、uh, I like to learn on, hands on on the job,、um, and that really, really definitely、uh, helped prepare us to be a,、um, a syndicator where we at today. Yeah. So passive investment is definitely a path to kind of test the water before you kind of go emerge、uh, fully into it. Um, and then a the passive investment means that you invest in with someone who is experienced, like Kenny,、um, over here as well. You know, all you know, other syndicators and etc. So、um, from there, tell us a little bit about your first active deal. How did you sure?、Um, yeah. Yeah. So it was.、Uh, it was that. That was another leap of faith.、Um, and so、um, I didn't really have a、um, like a guru group to raise money from or anything like that. Just kind of friends, family, and folks I knew、um, from some networking events I'd been to. 
um, found a 76 unit property. Um, and that was in 2012. Um, uh, found that deal. Um, it was brought to me. I, I actually didn't even know what city it was in. It's in DFW, but they, you know, they brought it to me. Hey, it's, it's a deal in Wiley, Texas. And I asked them where the heck Wiley was. Um, <laughs> it's like 30 minutes from my house, but I don't know. I didn't know where it was. So yeah. anyways, drove it like, oh my gosh, we gotta, I gotta do this deal. This is a great deal. Um, and then, uh, uh, but I didn't have the money raised. Right. So it was a deal where, okay, you gotta have 75, you know, hundred K to go at least launch the deal. And then you have to raise the money in about 45 days right. uh, to close it. So, you know, so again, it was one of that big leaps, leaps of faith and, um, you know, got some good encouragement uh, from both my wife and some other folks in my life at the time and um, just to go for it. And uh, we went for it and uh, we closed it and uh, nice. the rest is history. <laughs> how, how did you raise that money? Because I, I, you made it sound so simple with like the first deal. But we all know it's not very simple. Like everything like you alluded to is a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, so how did you like what was the most challenging in that, uh, you know, transaction? Just the unknown, right? I mean, you're signing on the dotted line, but you're 75 or 100K, whatever you're into it, it's basically gone. Like, if you don't close this thing, you're out, you know, out of 75, 100K. So, um, and then, um, so that's, that's big encouragement to call everybody, you know. Um, so I, I, I burned up two Blackberries, you know, at the time, um, calling everybody I knew. Uh, we actually ended up over raising, but um, the biggest, like, uh, biggest learning point I, I, I had was um, uh, there was a big investor that had said all along he was going to be in for, you know, 75K or, you know, um, about 8% of the whole equity raise. And uh, it was two weeks to close the thing. And, he's, and I call him up, hey, hey, where's your money and paperwork? Um, yeah. He goes, oh, yeah, I had a bigger, bigger, uh, big, uh, bigger IRS bill than I thought. So I can't invest. Right. And so at the time, 75K was, was a big ask for me to go scramble with two weeks. Uh, we ended up over oversubscribing, so it wasn't a big deal, but that was a big freak out moment. I gave myself three seconds to freak out and then, you know, <laughs> all right, just get back to the phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So make sure you don't count on big investor on your first deal. And uh, uh, I guess exactly. uh, sure you're diversify your investors, right? So um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Um, so from the seven seventy six unit deal, um, and then we may be kind of touching back to this other deals that you kind of alluded to. Uh, so from there, um, you know, you guys did, and it is is it a value add? Um, can you kind of go a little more details on that particular deal, how it's performing, like how did it perform? The, the stuff that you learned sure. operating it, yeah. Yeah, so that so that deal was really just a uh, we bought it as as a yield play. Um, it was 2012. Um, it was an 82 construction deal, yeah. um, and so it was kind of a B. It was already pretty much fixed up. So we really just bought it um, initially for the cash flow. Uh, what we ended up doing is um, we've we've we still own it today. We've we've done a refi on it twice. Nice. Um, so we've pulled out 430 percent of, of uh, returns nice. to investors um, over the um, over the you know eight nine year run that we've held it held it. Um, and, uh, which is nice because it's a, obviously cash flow and, and, uh, uh, the cash flow now is, 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 uh, is, uh, probably taxed to, at, at the, at that level, but, um, the refinance proceeds, you know, having that much out is, is pretty awesome. Um, uh, but, but we actually are now because we've hold it so long, we're on our second round of our second level of upgraded unit. So we upgraded, you know, half the units initially, uh, to one level, and then those are all bought up. And then we kept doing that and, and. And then, uh, then we had to make up a whole nother way to upgrade the unit um, and get more rent. So, and it's it actually, it's worked out perfectly. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and and also, you return all the investors' money, so they're happy like four times that their money. Four times, yeah, they're pretty happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that one. They have investor four one. times. Yeah, the other deals. Exactly. Like, well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's obviously a great home run over there. So from there, what was your second deal like? How did you kind of get to from seventy six, you know, now to uh, fifty six? Uh, sorry, fifty six hundred at some point. Um, you know, kind of going. What what was your next level of growth? You know? uh, so that, let me take down our second syndicated deal was one hundred thirty three units in Denton, Texas. Um, that was a D class, so that one was a major fixer upper. Um, uh, we bought it for uh, 34k a door um, back in 2013, early 2013, and then um, uh, put in probably about eight, nine k a door of rehab. But then ended up, I can't tell you how much I sold it for because it's a, Texas is a non-disclosure yeah. state. Nobody but we that. ended up, <laughs> yeah. But we ended up doing it was it was it, that deal was uh, was a three x deal uh, from for seven year hold nice. uh, on that one. That's awesome. That's awesome. So a lot of value adds and etc. Um, 
what would you say? So these two deals are very different um, in terms of the lift. So for someone who's kind of getting into their you know first deals or, or when they're in, thinking about passive and investing, um, what would you say? Um, you know what to watch out for. You know between these two, because sure. we get you know, we, I get these emails all the time too. They're like, oh, it's a D class, like, you know, this and that, there's a lot of value. You can see a lot of value, but there's also risk involved. So oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what would you say to someone who's kind of evaluating these deals, the two on a different spectrum, um, how they should think about it when they're passive investing into that? Yeah. Sure. On the passive side, you know, really it's kind of, you know, um, we, you have to think about what, about the end of kind of what, what's the end goal, you know, and when right. do you want to retire and when do you need cash flow? You know, um, you know, typically, uh, and this is this is typical. So everybody's got different rules of what what, what they want to do. But I mean, if your goal is to retire in the next, you know, fifteen years, well, then you could probably do more of those D class value add deals. You don't need the cash flow today, right? Uh, but if you're getting closer to that retirement, you know, want to hang it up and and uh, and retire early, or re you know, retire whenever whenever you want to retire. Yeah. Uh, you know, cash flow is kind of more your should be more your um, what's your focus investor it's uh, kind of where they're at on their path to financial freedom gotcha yeah that's great that's great um putting it up over there uh now it is a quite different structure usually a syndicator has a signature in terms of um you know like um they do a yield play all the time so they do a value add all the time let alone D class value add, because that's not really value. That's almost like <laughs> half new construction. Um, right. So like, you know, like how did you kind of then skill between, you know, different kind of strategies over here? Um, no, I, I think that's a great question. Um, we get that a lot because not only do we do multifamily, we also do triple net and ground up development projects right. as well and redevelopment. So we, you know, um, and those are the kind of three areas we focus on. Um, you have to cap it at some point, right? Uh, but, um, you know, to transition from on uh, you specifically about multifamily, you know, um, sometimes it's the market, um, it's better to buy a B and C and D class, um, sometimes better to buy an A class, um, you know, and, and each market's very different as well. So we're in Texas, Ohio, um, Oklahoma, Louisiana right now. Uh, we're actively buying in Texas and Ohio, but, um, you know, like in Cleveland, we're buying for cash flow. Um, you know, but, you know, here in Dallas, we're buying A class properties um, for cash flow and then um, higher appreciation because they're lower cap rate deals uh, as well. So um, you have to look at each each market's different. And if you're, you know, I always thought if you're if you just pigeon your whole whole self yourself to like B and C class in Dallas Fort Worth, like right now, those prices that, that folks are paying are insane. Right. Um, you know, I don't I don't get it. So you have to you have to change with the with with the market. Um, you can't just keep um stick into one thing otherwise you're going to get uh, either no deal flow if you're if you're um you know if you're a conservative you know you'll buy nothing right. or or um uh, or you'll um or you'll buy something you shouldn't right. <laughs> so. yeah that makes sense um that's that's very interesting so i'm gonna get into this these golden nuggets a little bit more now I'm always interest our listeners sometimes always interested to hear about like the most random question i always get a uh, common question I always get is where do I buy multifamily, right? So which market to look for? So you mentioned about Ohio and Dallas. Um, I'm guessing some of these plays are very strategic. Um, and, and then why do you go into these markets that you're going into and giving 2020, 2020, 2021, the post pandemic, where do you see uh, some of the good markets to kind of watch out for? Yeah, sure. So we're like I said, we're actively buying in Texas and Ohio. Um, in Texas, we're looking from Longview to El Paso. So from, you know, uh, West Texas to East Texas. Um, and, uh, uh, and we're buying everything in between right there. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we've, uh, this year we've already bought some, uh, pro another property in East Texas and Longview, Texas. We love that market. Um, you know, and to summarize it, um, it's a slow growth market on population, but it always grows. Mm -hmm. um it's um but what like out there what we're finding is we're you know we're, we're um we bought three off-market deals so far uh, we're paying you know dallas price per doors like three four years ago but we're getting dallas rents today um mm -hmm. out, out in east texas so that the cash flow and the value advert we're creating out there is pretty massive uh, but then again we just bought an a plus deal in downtown dallas you right. know um, and that deal is you know was a uh 
that 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 deal should have gone to a an institutional buyer. Um, it should not have gone to us. But um, COVID kind of scared them out of that downtown core markets like that. Um, so we picked up this asset. I, it's absolutely beautiful, um, but it's a totally different play than that big rehab out in East Texas, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then yeah, we bought another. It. Oh, go ahead. I love it. You you kind of like provided an investment opportunity that's diversified enough for your investor over there too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we like to do that because it gives another a different uh, risk and reward ratio for each you know each multifamily and also the different types of offerings we also offer too do that and they all they actually and they all have enough different flavor of benefits of uh, um, the tax benefits as well mm -hmm. got it and then so why a class in dfw uh because while everybody is else is kind of like chasing after b and c classes in dfw market you know why a class i know you kind of touch on this a little bit more but can you kind of get into a little deeper for us on that sure yeah i mean i mean i mean i think you said it like everybody's looking for bnc value out in dallas fort worth i mean everybody's doing it right so the cap rates have come down to you know below six on a, on a bnc class well we're buying these a classes are third to, to buy here in dallas fort worth at a five and a half cap rate you know um so the a class they haven't really compressed um because they really haven't had a place to go uh so if we're going to pay a low cap rate i'd, I'd rather buy a, a better located newer asset uh, with lower operational cost. Um, and that actually what we found uh, was we, we actually introduced an upgraded unit to a building that was our first A class here was built in 2018. We bought it in 2019. So right off, you know, the, the I think the paint was barely dry, uh, but we bought that deal. Um, but we introduced an, an, an upgraded unit on a brand new built property and we're getting it like it's in, it's insane. So we're creating about a lot of value there for our investors you know, and then we did that same model across the other ones as well. So, yeah. Um, so know. we're going to have like a very selfish question to ask you there, which is uh, what is the upgrade that you're doing over there on the A class? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this, I mean, so they're beautiful. That's exterior wise. They did a great job. Interiors were, 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 were pretty good. Right. So that's kind of where we put our money. Um, they already had granite countertops. They had the beautiful cabinets, wood flooring. I mean, it was, it was very well done. So what we did, um, uh, was, um, you know, that seller, uh, uh, put in black appliances. Mm -hmm. Um, so we switched those out to stainless steel. Um, uh, we did a, we did, we did a glass tile backsplash in the kitchen, mm -hmm. um, some fixtures, some fans. So for about 2,500 bucks, we're getting between 150 and 225 more a month than rent. Yeah. Cause the aesthetic which is just is a lot better, which is, is amazing. I mean, because you're getting about, a, you're, you're, you're about paid back in one year on your capital investment. Yeah. Um, so not only that, but also your cash flow goes up, obviously. But two, because it's an A class, I mean, to put that uh, underneath a five and a half cap rate, mm -hmm. I mean, the value gain is massive on those. Right, right. And then even if you just kind of focus on operation efficiencies over there. Um, and now kind of comes to my second question, if you kind of tease up perfectly for it. My understanding is you also own a PM company like property management company. So essentially right. you guys are vertically integrated. Now tell us a little bit about the transition because you didn't use to own a property management company. You were using third-party manager. What, why that transition? And the, at what level you kind of made that switch? So I, I, about three and a half years ago, um, I got frustrated with third-party management. Um, they wouldn't listen to me. Um, so, uh, and I've got, I've got an accounting background. So, you know, one of the folks, one of the third parties we used to use, I would just have to correct their accounting like every month. And I felt like I shouldn't have to do that. Um, and then, then to, to some other ones, you know, because as I got seasoned, like you shouldn't, you know, for a, a hundred unit property, we shouldn't need two people in the office. Like there's another company, third party that we use that like to like overstaff the property. Um, so, you know, and, and finally I said, okay, fine. If they're not listening to me, then I either need to go build it, which is a horrible idea. Don't ever do that. Um, or B the better one is to buy into one. So that's what I did. So I, um, uh, we actually teamed up with, uh, with allied property management on a small deal in Oklahoma. Um, it was actually a turnaround deal. So it's one of their, where we weren't the original sponsor, but we were voted in to turn it around and yeah. save it. Um, and so, so we did that. Uh, with them as kind of the guinea pig, uh, and uh, they did a phenomenal job. I think we took it over in October, um, and uh, they had it back from seventy, I think eight per, or seventy-five percent occupancy up to ninety-two by January, which is the slow season, right, of leasing. So they did a phenomenal job there. Um, the um, the owner of that property of that uh, property management company and I just we just hit it off. Um, we yeah. we uh, we get each other, we understand each other. So uh, it was like, okay, well then. Cause he was at a point where he had about 17, 1800 units under management. Um, and so he was kind of in that no man's land where he, he needed to, 
grow his um, unit count pretty quickly to hire better folks to keep building the business. Um, and I was charged with third party management. Um, so anyways, I bought into to the existing property management company. I poured all my um, units except for the Ohio properties um, into that portfolio just because logistics um, and basically doubled his unit count overnight. So all of a sudden we could hire the proper CFO, the operations. Um, so like, you know, our CFO at Allied Property Management was the Crow Family Trust CFO for 20 years. I mean, so, you know, you can start hiring the better talent, the more uh, when you have that three, 4,000 unit base to build off of. Yeah, yeah, that that's a fantastic point over there, because I think a lot of some of our listeners are maybe at that level and then thinking about like, oh, how do we go like a vertical integrate? Um, and uh, so, OK, so you, you did pour all your um, th and that's fantastic negotiation as well as partnerships. So there's like <laughs> oh, up over there. Um, and then you at one point you got to five thousand six hundred units. But my understanding is now you have three thousand eight hundred. So, you know, what is the transition over there? Um, not transition, but obviously you sold and made a profit. Um, and then so it's like kind of like, is it is it kind of ties into that economy questions? Like, how should investors think about, you know, going you as a big house over here, 5,600 unit, but now down to 3,800. Are you still looking for investment? And um, if so, what are some criteria you look for? And what should our investor kind of take away from that? Yeah, sure. No, so we, we've been very active. We bought, um, I think this first quarter, we closed on almost $30 million of acquisitions um, on the multifamily side and a few dollar stores as well. Um, but, uh, uh, and then we've got another probably five offerings coming out to our investors on our investor portal. Um, so we're very active. Um, three of those are existing multifamily. Um, and then there's two, uh, one, another ground up development deal we're working on um, in downtown Cleveland. Um, and then we have another office to multifamily conversion coming on um, here pretty soon down in Atlanta. So uh, we're very busy on the acquisition side. Uh, the existing multifamily, like I said, we're buying two assets there in Cleveland. Uh, right now, our goal is to get uh, to buy cash flow in Cleveland and wait for the cap rate compression to come. Um, we're actually already seeing it. Um, I had a visit in Cleveland for, um, well, just two days ago, but I was again there a month ago um, yeah. and they uh, had dinner with a, with a broker and the new cap rate for a C-class in Cleveland is six and a half. And we were buying 18 months ago. We started buying up there at eight. Um, so we're see, starting to see the Chicago and New York City investor flee their, their, what their rent control they have to deal with um, to markets like Cleveland, Columbus, um, all of Texas. Uh, we're selling um, an asset right now um in el paso and the top five investors were either from california or new york city um, just because they're tired of what they have to deal with so uh, for those that are looking for markets to look in you know we always start at the state level is it a is it a, is it a landlord friendly state you know if you're in the business to to rent units um you know you got to stack the chips in your favor so you know so we look at landlord friendly states um and then when you drill down to what cities should you buy in well um, are they growing population wise historically um, is it a diverse employer base? So, you know, in markets where it's, um, I always pick on Colleen, Texas, and I shouldn't, I'm going to get a nasty note one day, uh, <laughs> but I pick on that because it's basically, uh, you know, almost all the jobs are tied to, to that military base, right. not that it's bad, but they can, they can pack up and leave and, and not owe you any rent. Um, so that's a problem, um, on, on, on the business side. So, uh, that, or like, if you, if you're in Midland Odessa, it's all oil and gas. So if you own real estate in Midland Odessa, you're really in the oil and gas business, not not in real estate. Um, so that so diverse employers for sure. Um, and then you know, um, and then kind of, and then when you drill into the sub market, you know, is it growing? Is it gentrifying? Or is it dying off? You know, because um, there's only so much capital you have. So you know, you, you don't want to be the uh, the pioneer um, right. uh, to to you know start start the gentrification process. Uh, <laughs> but but you do want to be a settler. Um, yeah. So make someone else may be the first move and then you can, you know, it's better to be a settler than a pioneer. Block, uh, right? And then just change that. that point. Yeah. Cause that, that, that takes so much capital to do that. Right. So, you know, you can have this big dream and everything, but you got to also have the capital behind you to do it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And now how do you identify a market as gentrifying? Cause the key, the golden eggs or like the golden nuggets here is like, be able to be able to spot a market when they're on the uptrend, you know, um, and then, so what do you right. do to determine that? I mean, 
you know, you, you look at traffic counts, you look at demographics and median income. We, we do all that kind of demographic research. Um, but that kind of sixth sense goes when you go like drive a property, I hate to say it, but you get this like warm and fuzzy feeling, or I do, you know, yeah. the, about like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a phenomenal property. You, you know, uh, there's just something about it. Um, like and a good example is the a second property we bought in El Paso. Um, um, it was a, there on the street that was okay. You could, there was some like shut down retail, but we saw like a, a little glimmer of, of retail coming back. Like we saw Panda Express ground up built in that, on that street. Like, okay. All right. So now, you know, so I think, you know, this is going to be great because it's right next to a high school, right next to, you know, some nice single family, you know, B class single family. Um, and then, you know, call it, you know, six months later, a new Starbucks is being built ground up. Yeah. Um, we had the, you know, all that vacant retail was redone and, and you know, they got a I don't know, D's discount and all kinds of retail in there as well. So now it's a, this revamped area. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually that one's about to go on the market Friday to sell. Uh, yeah. because we it was like 130 percent return to investors at, at our sales price over two years <laughs> so uh you know so then and they're not all like that i should say that they're not all like those returns but uh when yeah. you can hit that kind of return in two years i mean it's it's you know it's time to sell so yeah yeah definitely um and um triple net leases you talked about getting into triple net leases so you started with multifamily first um, and how many years into that that you decided to triple net leases is another business you kind of want to get into, um, right? It plays into, you know, your your main business or per se, like because you know we we kind of talk about multiple businesses over here. It's like at what point you kind of open that second second business or third business, right? So about about I guess six or seven years into my multifamily career, it was time to expand a little bit and offer something a little bit different. And so actually, I reached out to a, a mortgage broker friend that's been in the business forever, kind of asked him, okay, so what's the next step? Because a lot of folks believe single family and then multifamily. Well, I asked him, okay, well, what's next? What do you what what do people do after multifamily? Yeah. Uh, and he said, well, they either buy a medical office or they buy a triple net, and not because they make more money, but because they're so boring. Um, and you don't have to mess with any kind of operations. Um, so, oh, okay. So anyways, um, so he kind of, he kind of, you know, uh, perked up my ears on that. Um, and then I started doing some research. And so what we do now is, and we've always from the get-go started buying um, properties, most of them are, or all of them so far are single tenant, but, um, but the sole, the, the only folk, only tenants that we look for are high credit publicly traded companies. Um, and we do that because the public traded company guarantees the rent looks really bad if they don't pay you rent um, on Wall Street. So they won't, they're going to pay you rent. Um, <laughs> and then two, you can trust their financials. So if you buy a strip center with mom and pop owners, like you don't know if you can trust those, those, those tax returns or that you look at or their financials, like, you know, um, yeah. you can't trust that. So, um, and uh, so that's kind of why we focused on the, the, the high credit um, public traded companies. Um, and most of what we bought are dollar stores. So we mostly own dollar generals, family dollars and dollar trees. Uh, we did buy our first advanced auto parts in Walgreens um, the past couple months. So kind of starting to branch out a little bit. Yeah, Walgreens are great. Uh, <laughs> they are great. <laughs> They're always yeah. going to be there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Um, and uh, it, that's awesome. So triple net leases. And then you then you got into developments. So like. And, and that's like the polar opposite of triple net leases, right? So for <laughs> you know triple net, we're buying these for the boring monthly cash flow we send out to investors, right? But right. for development, if you want spicy, this is this is for you, uh, you know. So because it's all appreciation, right? So there's no cash flow right. uh, most of the time, um, and then uh, but it's big appreciation. We're going for that, you know. We're we're, we're aiming to double their money in two to three years um, at the end of our lease up of the property. Um, so so that you know we can offer a, a wide range of risk and reward ratios. Uh, like I talked about earlier, uh, to to everybody, they want to mix them in. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then what is the drive for you to kind of drive into the new builds? Uh, I guess triple net, you touched on that. Is it just to increase kind of the margin? Because at some point when the market is becomes super hot, uh, the the value add come to a certain extent. Is it, like what is your drive to kind of get into the new builds? Right. So like, you know, there's markets we wouldn't build ground up, but there's markets we definitely would. Uh, so I'll pick on Dallas Fort Worth. Um, so the B and C class stuff is selling for 90 to 110, 120 a door is what I heard the other day for a C class in Fort Worth. Um, we can build these ground up for like 130 to 145, no, now 145 with the lumber issues we're dealing with. But, but still at the end of the day, you know, if they're paying 90 to 110 for a B and C class, and we're getting brand new units at 145, even at, even at that high level. I mean, 
still a good deal. I'd rather do that than buy B and C where you have plumbing issues, where you have AC issues and ongoing operation issues where and a brand new build, you're going to have some of that, but, but not near as much. Right. Um, and they're just easier to operate. You get better, um, you get better rents, you know, so. Your tenants depends on the location that you pick. Um, that's awesome. But yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and then, so how do you kind of go about it? So as you kind of expand all your business into this, we want to kind of switch gear a little bit in terms of systems and like stuff that you kind of put in place uh, to build this business. So when we first started was the multifamily, you had yourself and maybe some partners. Um, and, uh, and then from oh, just me, it was just me on the asset management side. So I was, yeah. I was doing everything. I was scanning in documents. I was like, you know, everything. So, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but then started hiring for hiring folks here at the office now. So we, and we keep on hiring that we just, um, uh, I don't know if I should say this or not, but we just posted a, a, a another job for our, for, in our accounting department, uh, yeah. to help with that. So, you know, we just keep on uh keep on growing so yeah so so from one man to two men or like having your first employee what is that experience like and um what could our viewer kind of take away if they were thinking about hey i'm at the point because the, the first is always most zero to one is always most difficult so it goes right. with first employee and in your opinion looking back where you were before like who would you recommend is the first person you should hire no, that's a good question. So, um, and, uh, it, and it's a funny story because so um, I was still working out of my uh, my home office, right? And right. so I had this, but I like, okay, I got to get somebody. And I should have hired her six months before I actually did, right? So I I was a little late, but anyways, better late than never. Um, so we, um, so I actually had my interview at a Starbucks and 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 had to tell her that like, look, um, I'm a real company. I'm really going to pay you, but I don't have an office yet. We're getting it in about two months, but we're not, we don't have an office yet. Um, right. and so she is, uh, she was crazy enough to accept the offer. Um, uh, so anyway, so, uh, but, um, uh, you know, who, who to hire your first time, uh, for me, um, it was, it was kind of admin and investor relations, things like that, because the, you know, as we kept doing these, um, you know, these new offerings, we get a whole slew of, of new investors in and the surge paperwork and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And so um, she was also very good at digital marketing, which was a weakness of mine. Um, so she does all that great digital marketing. I'm no good at that. Um, so anyway, so, so, you know, it was partly of what I need there. Also, you know, look at what, what your, what are your weaknesses as a, as a entrepreneur um, and a, you know, the leader of the ship, uh, you know, what, what are you weak at and kind of fill those gaps. Got it. Got it. And then looking back um, on that hiring, not that particular hiring, but like the growth in your company as hiring strategy goes, do you, is there anything that you wanted to go back and like fix or hire different, not different person, but like a different position before the other one? Was right. There? Yeah. No, I mean, I think we did okay. I mean, because so, so the set, so the first was, 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 we just talked about Christine and then uh, second was Koi asset management. Um, and so we were starting to get to a point where um, our properties were outside of just Dallas Fort Worth. Um, and so I needed to, um, I needed to, I can't clone me. Um, and so what I did was hire asset management for our multifamily properties. Um, and that was great because then we could both, you know, we could go different directions on a plane. Um, and I could go see a property. He could go see the other one, things like that. So that was a, that was a huge help too, is that bring on the asset management um, on there. That's awesome. <clears throat> and at what, what point, if you give advice to people who uh, are viewers or who may want to start their own business and who doesn't want to have the one man, one man show, at what point, what's that break even point for you when you decided, hey, I feel comfortable enough to hire another person because that's res the responsibility when you hire a full time staff. Oh, absolutely. You got, you, yeah, we got, I got, I got, I got a lot of mouths to feed up here now yeah. um, at the office. Right. So, uh, but, 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 um, so it's definitely a big responsibility, but too, like, if you look at your business, like, there's only so much you can grow it if it's just you. Um, and eventually you're going to drive yourself crazy. Uh, and when you work in 80 hour weeks or whatever it is, like you got to get back to normalcy and, and get to get, you know, get a life with your family and, and, you know, enjoy, enjoy what you're building. Right. So, um, so that was really, yeah, is that every time my, my, my rule of thumb was every time either myself or one of our employees, like felt like they were working way too much or couldn't breathe, uh, then, then, you know, just hire a new person, you know? So that's kind of what we've done. Is, is kind of the rule of thumb um, on that. And, and also too, what I do every six months is I sit down um, uh, and 
you know, give myself about an hour or so. And then I'll write down all the stuff that I do that I don't want to do or I shouldn't be doing. Um, and then, okay, now we need to figure out who's going to do this. And it's not me. Um, so, because, you know, cause eventually, you know, as the, as the, um, you know, um, you know, my, my keys are, uh, my key assets are, you know, finding, finding, you know, good investments. Um, and then, you know, and then in talking to our, our investors, um, yeah. Yeah. So. And anything in between, you can probably vendor it up. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right. So switching a little bit more because we have you over here. Where do you see? So we're just coming out of the pandemic right now. You know, there's a lot of negative news written about multifamily eviction moratorium. They're not as scary as they are. Um, but coming like for our viewer who are very interested in investing in real estate, you know, they always talk about, especially new investors, they talk about, am I investing in the right market? Um, and there's always a question on like, am I investing in the right asset? Am I investing in the right market? So what's your view, personal view, disclaimer, uh, we, don't, we all don't have this crystal ball, but what's your view um, on the areas of investment to kind of look for, you know, and, and we talked about market before, but like also like the areas of investment, the asset types, because you're sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so multifamily is still strong. Um, you know, our properties in. Um, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, I just got a text message in my ear. Uh, the um, our properties are you know off the coast. We don't buy in, in in the northeast. We don't buy in the west coast. And it's um, and then we're starting to see that through this you know through COVID nineteen, uh, people realize like maybe they should stop buying in New York City with all the rent controls or California where they don't want to cancel rent. You know, so. Um, and again, I'm picking on these states. I'm going to get some nasty letters, I'm sure. But, um, you know, in the states that we were in, we didn't really feel the effects of COVID-19. You know, people were still paying us rent. The folks that were affected, um, you know, if they could prove it, uh, that they were cut hours or laid off or whatever, we worked out a payment plan with them. So they could pay weekly because um, that's when they got their unemployment check. Um, and so now, like, we're, I mean, I just got off the, we had a uh, weekly call with our uh, Columbus, Ohio properties. We've got, I think, one person out of almost 600 units up there um, combined that that's playing the CDC eviction game, um, and 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 it's only about 30 days away before we can get that unit back. Um, so there's some states now that, like in Texas and Ohio, we can file evictions. Um, it's there's no this moratorium um, is if you actually read it and see there there's five hoops the, those folks have to jump through, and right. one of them is to set up a to set up a payment plan with with the landlord. Right. Right. Well, you know, so we, we file if they show us the CDC guidelines. OK, well, then we give it 30 days. And if they haven't set up a payment plan, well, we refile and then we can get back the unit um, in those states, though. Now, there are some states where in, in cities where you don't want to invest in and they're, they, they, they don't really um, uphold that those five rules that they're supposed to play by. Right. Um, so, so again, I mean, yeah. landlord friendly states, guys. I mean, that that's that's the key. Definitely invest there for multifamily. Um, on the triple net side, we don't really have to worry about the landlord boss, right? Mm -hmm. No one cares about Dollar Tree or Dollar General about their, you know, paying rent or not. So, um, so we're pretty, pretty agnostic on that, where we buy that. We're just, we're, we're buying a Dollar Tree outside of Chicago right now, where I would never buy a multifamily in Chicago, yeah. uh, but absolutely I'll buy triple net um, all day long. Um, yeah. Dollar Tree is the good one there. So, um, and then ground up development, the development plays, um, we kind of have two, two options there. We have ground up. Um, and then a big, um, and so we, we're doing that right now in Texas and in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and then um, kind of a big, uh, a big kind of uh, growth for our development arm was we bought our first office building in downtown Cleveland that we're going to convert to multifamily. Um, and so we've got like probably five more office buildings that want us to buy them to convert them over to multifamily. Um, so that's going to be a huge business uh, right. on, on our side and growth there um, as it's great opportunities to repurpose a building. They're vacant now. We're buying them pretty cheap. Um, um, and then being able to kind of get that A-class downtown apartment is going to be pretty awesome. So. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's very creative in terms of taking a asset type that has depreciated into, you know, like into an asset that's desirable. Uh, right. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's just like really all about guys. It's all about like a creativeness um, in terms of running your business and how you kind of build that big. Um, so I am scared to ask this question, but in five years, where do you see your company kind of goes, right? Um, and uh, because that five years that you're probably like moving in a lightning speed, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's three years, maybe it's five years, but 
um, what your biggest goal um, for your company growth and for your personal growth. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So on the company side, um, for those that are that want to be a syndicator or any kind of entrepreneur, you've got to read the book Traction. Um, that is a phenomenal book. Um, it'll really kind of lay out uh, lay out your um, um, it's a way to force you to sit down and lay out what you, what steps you need to do to grow as big as you want. Um, and so on, in that book, they talk about a 10 year horizon. Yeah. Um, it's the BHAG is their acronym for it. Big, hairy um, goal. Audacious goal is what they use. Um, so, um, uh, but I mean, so our, ours, ours is always um, in 2029 to have at least a billion dollars of assets under management. Um, we are well on pace to beat that. Um, so we already, um, uh, we like should be one, at one million and one billion already. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not yet, but we're working on it. I mean, I think today we're at like 300 or 320, 320 million. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of properties coming on um, as well. And then these office conversions from office to multifamily, those are going to move the needle. I mean, if these four go, uh, each will end up being probably 100 to 130 million dollar properties. Um, so right there alone, we'll have, you know, racked up another, you know, four or 500 million. Um, in evaluation. So that's kind of our goal. Um, so five years, um, I'd have to dig up the traction paper. I've got it written down somewhere. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, but that's really the bigger goal is hit that billion by 2029. But we're on pace to beat it. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, awesome. Well, so there's so much information impact in this. Um, and so Kenny, like close, like in one year, what what is your guys goal? Like that's kind of more immediate. So this way, like our investors can kind of hear about maybe your upcoming opportunity. Well, we're not like soliciting opportunities over here, but like right. what should they expect to coming from, um, you know, Wolf Investment in terms of this year? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so we've got, like I said, we've got four or five more projects already on the on the board to get, you know, eventually come on the investor portal. Um, and then um, we've got, um, you know, we've always got our, our we're, we, we're fortunate enough, we get a lot of first looks at properties right now. So, we get, um, you know, the past three years, all of our deals have been off market. Uh, so it's um, it's nice to be that way. Uh, so we usually are probably one or maybe out of maybe five that actually get to see it first uh, before it starts, um, before anyone else sees it. So we kind of have that inside track. So we're looking at a lot of those deals right now, uh, making sure they pencil out and are good investments. Um, uh, but we, I'm sure we'll land a few more of those as well. And then our triple net, um, that fund closes out in September to new investors. So. Uh, that was one's kind of ongoing. So we'll probably end up with another eight to 10 stores in that fund um, as well. We have two funds before that. So that's awesome. All right. So we're going to switch gear to our last couple questions um, in terms of, um, you know, we we're, we're like really passionate about financial independence. So my question for you is one kind of be a little out of what works um, is what are you doing to help your children? to learn the financial knowledges, to, to become financial independent one day themselves? Um, yeah. That's a very good question. I, I, that's the first time ever, anybody's ever asked me that. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, so, I've been, so I've got a 12 year old daughter and a three year old son. Um, so the three year old's a little, little young still, but, so he, but it's pretty soon he'll start on them. Cause so I started taking my daughter when she was five on these business trips, at least once a year, she gets to pick a city we go to. We fly up, she gets, we get her on, I get her on site. She meets, talks to the managers. We walk the properties. Um, and then it's full bribery at that night. She can pick what we go do rock and roll hall of fame in Cleveland or a basketball game or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, but it's really paid off. So at the age of 10, um, that summer she was said she wanted to make some money. And so she, I said, what are your ideas? And she said, uh, dog walking or, or lemonade stand. I said, you're thinking too small. Um, here's rich dad, poor dad. Um, and so she, she's a good reader. So she read them today. Um, and then I come home, uh, come home and, and, uh, and she, uh, um, she goes, okay, I'm going to take over the family business one day. So, all right, it's working, you know, it's working. The trips are working. And then two, I'm going to buy my first single family rental this year. I was like, well, that, I love that goal. Um, I, you don't have the money to do it, but go figure it out, you know? Yeah. So, um, so she did. So she actually came up with a business plan, found the zip code she wanted to be in. Um, she, she had, um, she'd been getting a, a couple of stocks here and there for my parents on the, uh, for Christmas and birthday. So she cashed them in. She had five grand to her name. Um, and then um, and then she pitched her grandmother to form an LLC to buy this single family rental. It <laughs> was a fixer upper. Um, yeah. They bought it. Um, and I mean, she's already, they're already actually about to do a cash out refi of that, of that house, pull right. out 40 grand and go buy a second house for basically no more equity. 
I awesome. mean, it's just, it's insane. So she already seeing that she's seeing the, uh, the education piece is just, you know, it's priceless um, on, 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 on that. Cause not only was it a, you know, kind of a financial education, but too, it was, you know, dealing with contractors and vendors and, you know, all that as well. So it's pretty cool to see. It's a very proud, proud dad moment when she bought it. And yeah. uh, uh, it'd be fun to see how she keeps on growing it. Um, yeah. And then my son, he's three, two years old. I'll, I'll start the same thing. Get him on a plane and go visit some properties. So. Nice, nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I'll be very interested to see these uh, contractors face when they saw her. Wife. Yeah, with a 10 year old, right? <laughs> uh, that's so awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kenny, for um, today's interview, dropping all these knowledges and really kind of mapped out for some people a life, life, uh, lifelong times, so how you kind of build your empire step from step, step from the first uh, first deal to to you know, now a huge portfolio like that. Thank you so much for your appearance today and um, looking forward to kind of chat more. Thank you very much.